Hi. My Boxford lathe has a screw-on chuck, and I ran into a problem recently where I could not unscrew it after having done some high torque work on it. Uh, I do remove it quite frequently, but this time it just wouldn't unscrew. Uh, I have a habit of putting it in back gear if I need to create a bit of a resistance to rotation. But that's not good because you can chip the, uh, or even break the teeth off the back gear. So I need a way of locking the spindle while I try to unscrew the chuck. Uh, so this program is actually about making a spindle clamp. I did actually get the chuck off the spindle without using a clamp by warming it up in hot water, as you can see here. I siphoned the water out to avoid spills. So that you know what we're about to make, this is the spindle clamp that we are going to build today. The spindle gear is machined into the end of the spindle and to get access to the full circumference of that we need to remove the tumbler gears and the stud gear first. So after removing the stud gear we can see this retainer that holds the reversing tumblers in place. So just use an allen key to remove that one piece and then you can slip the tumbler gears off. Goggles and earmuffs on, watch off and wedding ring off and we're ready to go. Because of the forces involved, I bolted the vise onto the bed of the pillar drill using these T-bolts. I made this from a piece of aluminium bar stock, 12 millimeters thick, so that it would have enough width to grip onto the gear wheel well. And it's 50 millimeters wide by 500 millimeters long. That's about half an inch by two inches wide by oh, uh, almost two feet long. It requires a hole to be drilled, about 1.3 inches in diameter, 33 millimeters. And I thought I'd try a little something different this time by using a flying cutter to try to cut this hole since it's in a plate 12 millimeters thick. And the idea didn't actually work because the shape of the flying cutter doesn't allow it to go into full depth, but I gave it a try. I should have made sure that the aluminum plate was actually level. So cutting more on one side than the other. Well, that idea didn't work out too well, so I decided on another method. I've got an end mill here in the drill and using the rotating table to uh, scribe a circle 33 millimeters in diameter. And that worked quite well, except that the end mill tended to clog up with aluminium and eventually broke a tooth off the end mill, actually. I should have been using cutting fluid, but of course it's not set up for that, and I only had two hands. The next stage is to drill a hole along the length of the piece of material, it's 12 millimeters thick, and because trying to do this with a hand drill tends to wander off course and drill out the side of the plate, I decided to mount it this way in the pillar drill. The bolt is an M6, that is 6 millimeters in diameter, in a 12 millimeter plate, leaving three millimeters on either side. I used a level to make sure that the piece of work was vertical and also used it to check that the pillar drill itself was mounted vertically. This hole needs to be threaded and uh, to ensure that the tap is straight I'm starting it off in the uh, chuck of the pillar drill and then I'll finish it off by hand. Choosing a stainless steel 6mm M6 cap head bolt. Now measuring, cutting and filing the slot. You may recall that the stud gear is actually a compound gear with two gear wheels connected by a keyway and the gear that is closest to the casting has to have the same number of teeth as the spindle gear and since I've removed that gear anyway I've got it available for testing the diameter of the hole. The reason that these two gears have to have the same number of teeth is that it is designed so that the stud turns at the same speed as the spindle.
Here I'm using a broken hacksaw blade which I've ground on the bench grinder to fit the jigsaw and that is an easy way of cutting this uh, quarter circle around the end and now I'm filing it off. And I'm using a wood rasp which turns out to be very good for doing aluminium because it doesn't clog up with bits of metal. Now we need just a quick jet of compressed air. You would think that the thread is actually what holds, holds the chuck in the line, but actually it's the seating against this uh, boss here really ensures that the chuck is uh, lined up properly. So that part should be nice and clean. An experienced engineer pointed out that he's been using for 40 years a washer made from brown paper to fit onto the register at the end of the thread and this stops it from binding. This register is actually what keeps the chuck perfectly aligned and I was a little surprised that he did that but I guess the brown paper is sufficiently uniform in thickness and sufficiently uncompressible that it's able to maintain pretty good register. So that's a trick that works well. I've always put a little oil on the thread of the chuck to, in the thought that that might help and others agree but uh, it was also said that if you use oil you'll get dirt and swarf sticking to it and that causes problems. Another engineer mentioned that when they were working with stainless steel they used milk of magnesia on the surface to prevent them from binding. So perhaps the answer is a piece of brown paper soaked in milk of magnesia with a little oil on the thread and now I've got a clamp that I probably will never use because it'll never get stuck again. Finally, we should talk about how to actually turn the chuck once you've got the spindle lock in place. Often people do it by putting the key in the chuck and just yanking on it, but this can damage the keyhole. And another way is to put a bar across the jaws and apply quite a lot of leverage that way, but that could damage the jaws too. And probably the best way of doing it is to put something in the chuck, such as a piece of hexagonal bar and then using a socket wrench or spanner on that to turn the chuck or some variation on that if you're using a four-jaw chuck a square bar would be more appropriate. So good luck with this.